Hello, I'm Stephen Childs of virtualvoicelessons.net and I would like to welcome you to today's lesson entitled Consonant Connections and the Flowing Nature of Voice. What we will take a look at today is how we can make our voices flow within a song. Now most of us have heard the term flow used to describe singers either in a positive light, man that singer really had a nice flowing voice, or a negative light. That singer's voice just didn't flow too well, and so on. But what does the descriptive word flow really mean to us as singers? It simply means an unbroken connection of words and word phrases. You see, when we break the flow of sound within a phrase, the voice starts to sound jagged and disconnected, and to most listeners, starts to sound unpleasant. It also is a huge contributor to glottal shock, which can lead to serious vocal cord injury. The reason for this can be described in a basic principle, and that is, sound does not like to be trapped, and sound does not like to be broken. Let me repeat that. Sound does not like to be trapped, and sound does not like to be broken. Here's an example that I often use for my students. Whenever I think about this concept of trapping and breaking sound, I'm always reminded of back in the day during the construction process with my first voice studio. One of the most difficult challenges that I had when I was building that studio was actually in the soundproofing of it. The amount of thought and resources needed to get even close to actual soundproofing is staggering because sound does not like to be trapped, and it will find a way to escape. And what I had noticed was that whenever sound escapes through a weakness or a small opening, the sound itself becomes altered. It loses its purity, and it loses its life. And this same truth can be heard in voice. If the sound of the voice or tone becomes trapped either by closing the mouth or throat or in this case, in proper use of consonants, the voice loses its purity and it too loses its life. Secondly, sound does not like to be broken. When we disjoin our phrases, they don't flow. And whenever sound isn't flowing, it is at that moment no longer considered sound. It is silence. What this should say to us is that sound wants to be moving not trapped, not broken. It is natural for sound to move. What we often hear in beginning voice students is a constant disconnection of their phrases and a trapping of their tone. Now, the trapping of the sound has mostly to do with vowel sound production and will be covered in great detail in our English vowel series as well as many other lessons. But trapping also has an enormous amount to do with the way we form our consonants and the way consonants affect the vowel. If we hold M's or R's too long, for instance, there is a muffled or harsh tonal change. Now, the breaking up of a phrase can be attributed to a couple things. First, a phrase can become disjointed and lose its flow whenever we drop our air pressure between words. Let me say that again. A phrase can become disconnected and lose the flow whenever we drop our air pressure between words. This can be heard in little unwanted H's and often happens when the phrase is going down. The other disjoining that occurs is through improper consonant connections and will be the thrust of today's lesson. But first, Let's take a look at what consonants actually are. Whenever I ask a new student what their definition of a consonant is, I often hear, well, it's the part of a word that's not the vowel. And every time I nod my head in agreement because this is a true answer, because words are really only made up of vowels and consonants. The interesting thing here, like many things in voice, consonants have multiple descriptions and several ways to categorize them. That's why it's sometimes hard to define. 
Now Webster's defines constants as the constriction or closure of one or more points of the breath channel. So in other words, we form constants by either constricting the breath or stopping it altogether. Now if we take the word consonant and break it down even further, so much more becomes clear, especially on how we should approach them overall. So let's take a look at the very definition of the word consonant. The main part of the word consonant is the word sonare or sonance, which simply means to sound. Now, the prefix con means in opposition to or against. This is where we get the phrase pros and cons, by the way. Those who are with us and those who are against. So we see what the description of what a consonant is just by looking at its very name. It is in opposition to sound. And what that should tell us is that consonants are not to be sung because they are the opposite of singing. Here's another way to look at them. The word sonata, when defined within music, is a short, beautiful music composition. Therefore, we can say that consonants in musical terms are short and most importantly, the opposite of beautiful. Here's another example. When someone has a sonorous tone, their tone is regarded as being rich and full of resonance. Consonant would then mean that they are the opposite of a full rich tone. All of these definitions all say basically the same thing. Consonants are not to be sung. In other words, they are not to be habitually held too long or made louder than the vowel they are next to because they are by definition ugly and they take away from our tone. So, if we don't sing consonants, what do we do with them? The answer is they are articulated. Now, the study of the use of the articulators, which is the tongue, the lips, the teeth, and so on, will be described in a later video lesson. But basically, it means that these structures either stop or reduce the airflow, which again means they are not sung, which also means they are not held. Not M's, not R's, none of them. So, the next main question is, what are consonants used for? Consonants have one great need, and that is definition. They simply separate words and make words more understood. We can also use this separation to define our rhythm. But the problem we face is when we separate words through consonants, we often stop the flow of sound altogether by not connecting them in the correct manner. Now again, consonants have multiple descriptions and several ways to categorize them. And as you will now see, putting them in categories helps us to understand how to use them wisely. We will now look at the different physical names for consonants in order that we can better understand how to produce and connect them correctly. Number one. The fricatives. These are the consonants that are formed by constricting the airflow with either the tongue or the lips, which causes friction. These are the consonants S, Z, F, V, Sh, Th, Th, and Z. The plosives. We get this word definition because of the explosive way in which that these consonants are formed. They are made by blocking the airflow and then sufficient air pressure is built up and then we let the air go in an explosion. This gives us the consonants T, T, D, T, K, K, G, or G, P, B and so on. The nasals. It's sometimes hard to believe that in one instance we are trying our best not to sing with a nasal voice 
And yet we have these three naturally occurring nasal consonants that could pop up at any time in a sentence. These are M, N, and N. The consonant N is one of the consonants that we don't usually think exists because it's not found directly in the alphabet. This consonant is found in words such as tongue, song, and in interestingly, the word sing. The glides. And we only have three consonants in the glide category, which is in actuality a great blessing due to the challenges that two of these consonants provide us as singers. The two challenges are R's and L's. Now R's and L's are the enemy of singers. The reason behind this is that R's and L's have a flipping action of the tongue. This flipping or glide actually hides the vowels that they are attached to. R's and L's are known to conceal vowels. For instance, many singers find words like torn and soul to be incredibly difficult to sing. And the reason behind these difficulties lies in the fact that they don't know what to sing because the vowel is being concealed. By the way, torn contains the vowel sound aw, believe it or not. Now let me demonstrate this for you. I'm going to sing the word torn. <laughs> Most people want to sing torn with rounded lips because they see that torn has a circle in it. It has an O, but it is not an O. It is the sound all. Take a listen. Torn, torn. Anything with or is in fact the sound all. Torn. So. I want to point out that the other consonant in this group is y, which is found in words like you or yesterday and is represented in the International Phonetic Alphabet as a lowercase j. Number five, consonant combinations. Another type of consonant in our grouping is actually the combination of two consonants together forming a single utterance or phoneme as it's called. They are x, which is really the combination of a k and an s and is represented by an x. This is found in words like fix or ax. We have j, which is a combination of a d and the sound j. This phoneme is found in words such as judge and Actually, in that word, it has it twice. Now, we have ch, which is a combination of the consonant t and sh, ch, and it's found in words like chief and chosen. You know, it's funny to think that my last name, Childs, actually has a t in front of it. Without the t, my last name would not be Childs, it would be Childs. <laughs> Number six. Pseudo consonants. There are a couple of consonants in English that are not really consonants at all. An example would be W. W's are actually the vowel sound oo. Try going from an oo to any vowel of your choosing and I guarantee you that you will hear the consonant W. One can think of this consonant as double oo. Another example of a pseudoconsonant would be through the usage of glottal shock, which can be heard used as a consonant in phrases like, uh-oh. They are known as stop consonants. Unfortunately, its usage is somewhat rare as glottal shock can be damaging if not used with careful concern. The second grouping, voiced or unvoiced. Many of our consonants can be paired together because they are actually related to one another. The pairing is whether they are voiced or unvoiced. Let's look at our first pair, which is T and D. Both are plosives and both are really the same thing, except D is a T with vocal cord sound. Let me give you a demonstration. T -t 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 -t. 
You see, they are really one and the same thing, except D has vocal cord sound. This is why I can change the pitch of a D, because it actually has a note to it, unlike its twin T. Another pair is S and Z. S Another is sh and zh, sh or f and v, p and b, and nasal consonants and glides are not paired, by the way, as they are all voiced. And this leads us to accidentally sing m's and n's and r's and l's and so on, which sounds like this. I'm your in. With this second grouping, we can learn how to properly connect one word onto the next and allow our voices to flow out of us, which not only sounds best, but greatly reduces the occurrence of glottal shock. So here at last are the rules on word connections. Number one, we always connect the last consonant or group of consonants from the left word and attach it to the right. Let me repeat that. We always connect the last consonant or group of consonants from the left word and attach it to the right. An example would be lost in your eyes. What we would do is take the S and T off the word lost and connect it to the beginning of the word in, which would make it law Stin. And we do this with every word that follows. So here's the entire phrase. It would sing, Lost in your eyes, which makes it flow nicely. Here's another example. Don't give my love away. Now, this phrase would sing, Don't give my love away. As you can see, I took the N and T from the word don't and connected it to the beginning of the word give. Don't give. I then took the V from the word give and connected it to the word my. Give my. Give my. And so on. Now, many singers out of habit from urbanized speech drop consonants all together within a phrase. By dropping the T between the word don't give, for example, sounds like don't give, don't give. This becomes very slang sounding and may or may not be the style you're looking for. One flaw in this style of singing is that it will definitely make the phrase less understood as again, consonants define the words we are singing. If we drop consonants from a word like a T, we will lose the clarity of the word, and therefore it is hard to know what the singer's actually singing. How many times have we thought a singer was singing certain words in a song, only to read the lyrics later to discover how far off we really were? Sometimes it's funny when we compare the word that we thought it was to the actual word that it actually was. It's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> So the bottom line is, if you want the lyrics that you poured your heart out over and countless hours refining to be understood, if you want your character story that you're portraying in your up and coming musical theater piece to be clear to the audience, then do not drop your consonants. Allow the words to flow from one to the other by connecting the last consonant or group of consonants from the left word and attaching it to the right. You will make it flow. You will reduce the occurrence of glottal shock and your voice will become more clear and understood to your listeners. Now, although we do not want to drop consonants from a word or phrase, we must be aware that we can indeed over-articulate. Over-articulation is one of those issues that seldom is addressed by voice teachers because more often than not, articulation becomes a pet issue with them to the point where again, to them, more is better. The better you articulate, the more trained of a singer you sound. 
But this is far from the truth. What happens through over-articulation is that the consonants take away from the voice by becoming distracting. Here's an example of over-articulation. Don't drive that dark green car. Don't drive that dark green car. As you can see, not only was the phrase not flowing, but was actually distracting. We never want to bring attention to our articulation. It is not the focus of a great singer to blow people's minds by how perfect each word was articulated. Consonants are there to highlight the voice, not draw attention to themselves. So always remember, consonants should never be louder than the vowels we are singing. Again, consonants should never be louder than the vowels we are singing. So even though we want our words to be clear and understood, making the consonants loud does not achieve this goal. It hinders it. The only way that we can articulate correctly is through the proper connection of words, which brings us to our second rule of word connections. Number two, we never double the same consonants including voiced and unvoiced pairs. So many problems that we encounter with consonants such as over-articulation or breaking the flow of the voice can be avoided through the application of the second rule is, which is, we never double the same consonants. And this includes voiced and unvoiced pairs. Let me repeat that again. We never double the same consonants, including voiced and unvoiced pairs. Okay, say that we have a word that ends with a T, like the word don't. And the next word starts with a T, like the word try. And if I say both words together, doubling the same consonants, we then have the over-articulated and non-flowing phrase, don't try. Here, listen again. Don't try. Don't try. The way to avoid this is simply drop one of the T's. Now it will sound like this. Don't try. Don't try. Much smoother, natural sounding, and in actuality, easier to articulate. The same applies to voiced and unvoiced consonants as well. In the first word, if the first word ends with a P, as in the word hip, and the second word starts with a B, like the word bone. Again, both of these concepts are actually the same thing. We need to drop one of them, or it will sound like this. Hip bone. Hip bone. <laughs> it's even hard to say. Hip bone. With voiced and unvoiced concepts, we need to drop the first constant and use the second, which would then sound like this. Hip bone. Hip bone. Perfectly articulated without over-articulating. So remember, whenever we have doubled consonants, drop one of them. With voice and unvoiced pairs, drop the first one. What I hope that you get from this lesson is how important of a role consonants play in keeping the voice flowing when we sing. If the voice is not flowing, then it is stopping and singing is the complete opposite of stopping. Try to pay attention to the words that start and end within a sentence. I remember how addicted I became with connecting random words together, that whenever I saw a word or phrase while driving my car, I would have to repeat it until it was perfect. Road signs, uh, billboard ads, and so on, give us a diverse variety of practice opportunities while driving. In general, find phrases that you like and repeat it over and over using the correct approach to word connections that you've learned today. To correctly articulate makes the voice free. Trapping or breaking sound is not flowing, which means it's not free and places an unnecessary burden on our vocal performance. I am Stephen Childs and I would like to again thank you for listening. And God bless.